Yeah, yeah, like yeah. More? Hey, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're looking in John chapter 5, um, verses 1 to 15. So I'll read those verses to you so you know what we're talking about. And by then, everything will be absolutely uh, fine. I'm just going to try it one more time. No, still not happening. So John chapter 5. Um, let's get into that. So if you've got a Bible, then do read. Normally, the words would appear on the screen, but um, due to <laughs> circumstances... So some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five co covered colonnades. Ooh, we've got movement. That doesn't work, then. Uh, five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is a Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick, up, pick it up and walk? The man who was killed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and, the, and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who have made him well. Are we good? Do you know, I think it might be the batteries. <laughs> in here. You go and try and change the batteries. Right, um, I'm going to do this, and if I do that, that means next slide. Is that okay? Well, we sort the batteries out. Okay. <laughs> it's not working at the back either. <laughs> well, this is a car crash, isn't it, guys? All right, I have got paper notes, just in case. We're going to start, actually, with a little bit of a history lesson. However, my history lesson did actually start with a graphic um, of a map of Jerusalem. So you're going to have to imagine now there is a map of <laughs> Jerusalem. This is really hard work, guys. <laughs> so Jerusalem, back in, in those days, um, at the time of Jesus, was a, a walled city, largely. Oh, we've got history. Next one. Yes, there we are. So, yes. Now, um, this actually made me chuckle a little bit. Uh, just go back once. Oh, no, I should stick to that slide. Yeah, 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 that's fine. So I've taken this photograph. I was looking for a really clear map of Jerusalem at the time, uh, and I found it in the back, actually, of Sarah's Bible. There's like the Hodder and Stoughton, you know, the big, thick one with leather bound and gold leaf on the outside. Had a map. I was like, perfect, that's what I need. We think that's working? We don't know. Uh, and very, very helpfully, the map has put A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K along the top, like grid references, but nothing down the side. <laughs> so in the I column, you can see in the top right, you've got the pools of Bethesda, and you can see, and I've put a little sheep in a little red thing there. That's the sheep gate. So that w from the account that we had actually in, in John, uh, we can see where these, um, where these uh, particular items were. But this is what we know now. This is the map we now have. About 200 years ago, those pools weren't actually <coughs> discovered. There's a problem. The pools that were um, known about around that sort of area were a bit like this. They were rectangular in shape. Um, and the pool that John talks about in the, uh, in the Gospel uh, was a little bit different. I don't know whether you noticed it. It talked about having five colonnades or porticos, five walkways. 
Now, uh, right, we've got some really intelligent young people down here. I'm looking at Will. No, intelligent young people. Um, Josh. <laughs> hey. Josh, if, um, if a shape has got four sides, what shape is it, if you were to describe it? Square. Square. That's a good start. Five sides? All right. So this is the problem, you see. So they've never found a five-sided pool. And that's what's described in John. So there's a big problem here that actually, can you trust John's account? He's talked about this in some detail, but that's not what they're seeing. However, in... Yeah, that's not working, so next one. <laughs> can we do next? In, um, in 1888... Can we go to the next one? Is it just not, it's just not playing ball at all. Uh, Dan, if you maybe do it the traditional way on the other PC and then click the button, yeah, that would be good. Sorry about this, guys. We had all these kind of great ideas to, to make this absolutely um, amazing for you guys, and it's all falling apart. So, um, yes, I'm going to have to go back to my paper notes as well. In 1888, uh, a new pool was actually discovered, and these are photographs of what was actually unearthed. It's quite deep down, actually, within the um, area of, of Jerusalem. You can see in the bottom left how deep they've actually had to dig to actually unearth this pool. Um, and uh, it was rectangular, again, but there was something different. So if we go to the next slide, and this is um, a, it's like a model village that they've built, which actually shows what that pool was like. I want to try it again. I mean, that, yes! Look at that. It's all working. So they um, actually found this pool with a fifth portico, or fifth colonnade. And what it was is the large pool, but with a divide down the middle, where this uh, fifth colonnade was. Now, a colonnade or a portico is like a, uh, an area that's kind of got columns, like colonnade, uh, an area where these uh, invalids would actually sit. And so we suddenly see um, what was going on there, and here's a different view of it. There was a, a, a northern pool, which is on the right, and a southern pool on the left. The northern pool was basically, they think, was a spring in there, and it fed the pool on the left. Um, and that pool was up to 13 meters deep, so it was really, really deep. You think this building or this room is about, what, five meters high at a push? Twice as high and a bit more as well. So it's a really, really deep pool. Um, and when they discovered this, they went, oh, hold on a minute. Well, this suddenly cast new lights on the book of John and what John had actually said. He was describing something that had five colonnades, five uh, walkways that went between uh, the, or around the, the pool. Suddenly, here's the evidence. And it sheds new light onto, onto the authenticity of the gospel as well. So this is a key historic uh, piece of evidence, which just shows and talks to uh, how we can actually look at John's gospel and how actually he was super accurate in what he described. And actually, it all makes sense and fits together. Uh, and you can actually just see in this picture that wall behind is the main, uh, I think at least, is the main temple wall for the, uh, for the temple itself. So it's very, very close to the center of Jerusalem, very close to the Sheep Gate. Um, do, 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 do. Um, so what happened, yeah, around this, this pool? So it would be in, this is um, sort of obviously uh, mock-ups and images of what it might be like, but there will be big wide steps that led down into the water. And those people who were uh, invalids or disabled or had some sort of infirmity would sit around the pool. And at the time, they would... Uh, wait for a stirring in the water. And if they saw that, then what would happen is they would jump in. The first one in there would get healed. That's what they thought, and that's what they um, would hang around there for. Now, we don't know exactly whether those sort of things actually happened or not, but we do know that this one guy had been there for 38 years waiting for that moment. Now, can you imagine what it would actually be like if you did have like a, a, a bad arm or a bad leg? And you think, actually, I, I hear that down here at the pool that if the water stirs, then fixes my leg. They couldn't go to Frimley Park. They didn't have x-ray machines and things like that to check out you know, what was potentially wrong. So this would be a, a key place that they could go and actually potentially change their lives. So you can imagine they're sitting around there. It's quite quiet, quite chilled out. So the water's still. And suddenly there's a flurry in the water. That's their opportunity. So what do you do? Do you kind of like go, water's a bit of a flurry. Gonna go and get in that water. Ah, someone else has got in there first. I imagine there would be a mad scramble to get in the water. <laughs> this made me laugh, this particular image. But I wonder if this is what it was like. In all seriousness, if you think, actually, I'm against the clock here. And if something happens, and this is my one chance to actually go and do something. Josh, 
Can you count to 10? Now do it again, reading the numbers on the board. Oh, he's sharp. If I'd asked Will to do that, we'd have got the four. <laughs> Sorry, well, Joel's not here today, so I've got to pick on you instead. Of him, so. But um, who noticed when we actually didn't see the words on the screen, but when we actually read the verses, verse four is not actually present in the, uh, in the scripture. Um, and it's missing, actually, from the very, very earliest manuscripts as well. Now, we'll get the word right here. There are people who are very intelligent, who look at um, scripture and words and old um, documents, and they are called, does anyone know? Sorry? Theologians? No, no, people who just look at the, just at the words and the print and authenticity of, of, of words, they're called paleographs or paleographers. Anyone ever heard of those before? Any experts in the room? No, I can make up what I like. Fantastic. <laughs> so they've been studying this, because it's actually, it happens quite a few times in the Bible where there is a missing verse. If you look very, very keenly, you might spot it from time to time. And verse 4 is not there. And what they've done is they've looked back at um, all the earliest manuscripts, and they actually find that in those earliest manuscripts that they're looking at, there is, if you like, an asterisk that sits by verse 4 or verse 3 and verse 5. A bit like in your Bible, if you look at now, you'll see there'll be a little A or B or an asterisk in there with a reference down saying, some scriptures may say, or oh, this verse has been taken out. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting. So they think it's been added in afterwards to give more veracity to what happened around the pools. So actually, you're probably wondering, what's the verse? What does it say? Shall I tell you? It's not in the Bible. Well, it's not in the Bible. Why should I tell you? But I will give you, it basically talks about uh, this, the um, stirring of the water and an angel stirring of the water. Now, we've got to be um, uh, careful here, because it's obviously been taken out. It sounds like it's been added in. And as they've looked at the scripture, they realized the words that were added, John doesn't use anywhere else. It's like it's a different voice that's actually describing what happened. Now, it's not to say that there wasn't an angel involved in stirring waters and people were healed. We don't know. We don't get that um, description out of there. But think back to what's happened before this time. Angels have been present, angels have been around, and angels have done things. But from the point of view of this actual passage, um, yeah, yeah, actually, sorry, this was a little thing I actually found. This, who knows where this is, but you have to know where this picture comes from. Central Park in New York. It's actually, um, it's the, the pond at this, in the middle of New York Central Park, and the angel on there is actually the, the angel that is represented by the stirring of the waters, at the pool of Bethesda. So they've actually done their own little thing, like almost like an homage to, um, to it. So there's, there's something about this pool that actually talks about peacefulness, rest, and restoration. Indeed, when you actually start to go forward through the years and look at what happened in that particular area of Jerusalem, this became a medical center as well. So the Romans built in this area as well is where people went to actually get treated. So there's a rich heritage in in kind of healing and things happening in this area. Um, but if we focus just on this and on the angel and stirring of the water, we're missing the point of what the actual uh, story is about. Jesus came and did something amazing. It wasn't about the stirring of the water. It was about what Jesus did. So, um, moving forward. I'm so glad I printed things out. I nearly didn't. What does this tell us about the, uh, the character of Jesus? So let's just recap on, on two verses in here, six and eight. I know I'm missing out verse seven. That's intentional. We'll come back to it. It's not missing from the actual chapter. Jesus saw the man lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time. And he asked him, do you want to get well? And then further down in verse eight, then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. So what does this actually tell us about Jesus and his character. Well, we can quite clearly see that he's a healer. There was no hesitation there. He got on with that. We also see his compassion as well. He got to know some of the people that are around there, and he found this guy who'd been there for 38 years. There was something that was stirred in him to do something about the situation. When it came to the situation, it came to the healing, it was immediate, wasn't it? So he told the guy, he didn't say, you are healed. He just said, Get, pick up your mat and walk. There was no hesitation there at all. And we also see that this is Jesus of the impossible. He's done something that is truly miraculous. 
everyone probably knew this guy that was there, 38 years. If you were 38 years old in that time, you were knocking on a bit, you, you know, fair old, you know, good innings, as it were. So suddenly to have someone there who's been there for 38 years, he would have been well known, and his infirmities would have been well known as well. And suddenly, out of nowhere, he's healed. But there is, if we go back a little bit here, there is this really interesting question that he asked the man. Do you want to get well? It's almost a little bizarre. You could argue it's sarcastic. If you went into Frimley Park Hospital and you went onto one of the wards and someone was there and said, do you want to get well? You say, well, of course I do, surely. But then you could take a step back and think about what was kind of going on uh, here. We look at the scripture again. And the guy, you know, doesn't give like, he doesn't answer yes. He doesn't say, yes, Jesus, I want to get well. Or yes, whoever you are. He didn't know it was Jesus at this time. He said, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. When I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. It's a bit whingy, really. It's kind of like, oh, I could, but it's not quite worked out that way. This guy probably actually had a routine. He probably did the same thing each and every day. He might even have a bit of a support network around him or people who provide food, move him around and help him do what he needs to do. So he's kind of in this place where he's like, yeah, you know, I want to get healed, but kind of a bit too much effort to try and get down to the water. But uh, Jesus is very, very direct. He says, pick up your mat and walk. Now, where we've seen um, in, in the other Gospels and in the other um, uh, healings that we see as well, when someone gets healed, who can, off the top of their head, remember what generally happens to those people who get healed? Do they go off and mope around? Feels like I'm back in kids' church now. No. <laughs> Do they jump up and praise God? Yeah, that's the right answer. That's what normally happens. There's this immediate kind of reaction of, of this is incredible, and they... There's a, a, a knowledge that something miraculous has happened and they go off and they jump around. In this instant, this guy doesn't. So Jesus slips away and then he catches up with him in the temple, which is kind of next door. And he says to him, uh, stop sinning. He says later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Really intriguing verse, I think. Rather than, you know, this guy's going for it and all the rest of it, he's kind of actually rebuked him here. Fascinating. I haven't got a, a detailed explanation as to why that might be or what was going on in this guy's life, but it sheds an interesting light, I think, on it. So, this has happened. The guy's been um, miraculously healed. Something quite special has happened on this particular Sunday, on this Sabbath day um, in Jerusalem at this pool. But what was the reaction that actually came from the people around, the Pharisees? The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it's a Sabbath, the Lord forbids you to carry your mat. Now I was trying to think, can I find a good analogy for this? And for this, I'm going to pick on Jake. I did warn him beforehand that he was going to get picked on. Do you know what? He's such a beautiful man, I'm going to invite him to the front. Everyone should bear witness to the man who's got more, more hair on his face than he has on top of his head. It's like it's flowed down. I, yeah, come on stage. Do you feel like acting a bit as well? Oh. well why, not? why not? Yeah. So what I was thinking is it, it's a little bit like, um, yeah, I think I, I lost my order a little bit here. But it's a little bit like um, Jake being on duty like he is this morning. He was meeting overseer today. He's in command of everything that happens operationally around here, including out into the car park. So he's been out there this morning, haven't you, Jake? You've been out in the car park yeah. this morning? Yeah, yeah. And you've been making a note of the registrations that park in the disabled spots, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if anyone gets healed this morning, you're going to go out there and put fines on their yeah. cars. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. It's logical, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you'll make a big issue of that as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Let's go, just to make sure. You can go now. That's great. Thank you for that. <laughs> but it, it's ludicrous. If there was a miracle here this morning and someone who could not walk suddenly was able to walk, someone who could not hear was able to hear, someone who could not see was able to see, would it be weird if 
Jake went, I'm sorry, but uh, you parked in the disabled spot, and you're clearly quite able to walk, you're getting a fine. And to focus on that and not look to the miraculous, it would be strange, wouldn't it? It's exactly what happened. Now, who here thinks they're a little bit uh, philosophical? Thinks they you know, like to operate on a higher level? Who here has heard of Schrodinger's cat? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I've got um, a new paradox for you. It's called the parking paradox. So if Jake is out there next week, and he's on duty out in the car park next week, he's not coming into the building, but Jake is full of faith. So people are arriving, and they're parking the disabled spots. They're going into the meeting, maybe in a wheelchair, maybe with crutches, maybe um, whatever it is that's um, wrong with them. What does Jake do? As they leave, he just sticks a fine straight on the car. He's got faith they're going to be healed. <laughs> he doesn't know when the healing is going to take place, but from his perspective outside of the village entrance, they are healed and they are not healed at the same time. So if you get bored with what I'm talking about this morning, I'm looking at you here because I know you'll enjoy this one as well. There's, there you go, you've got the parking paradox on a par with Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> Something that went through my mind and I obsessed about way too much. And there you go. So, <laughs> yeah, so actually if we do step back and just talk about the law here a little bit, from the point of view of what the Pharisees were doing, the Pharisees had the Old Testament law that they um, were given a long time ago and they enforced, but they built on it. They put more and more rules, regulations, traditions on top of that. And carrying your mat on a Sunday was one of those ones. It was frowned upon. It wasn't deemed as good to, to do. But what does Jesus do? He goes and throws this right in front of their face. Tells the guy, pick up his mat and walk. And this is um, significant in terms of the signs of, of the seven signs within, um, with John as well. This actually is a, a key point where he raises the ante, if you like. He raises the bar about who he is and what his intention is uh, to come. And if we actually look one verse ahead in verse 16 which is after the, uh, the actual miracle, we read this. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always up at his work uh, to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. So you can see here, there's almost like an entrenchment here. The Pharisees are going, right, we're going to stick our heels in here. This guy is, means business. He's not a flash in the pan. He's here and he's making a big impression. This was right next to as well. If you remember in the map, we saw those pools are right next to the main temple as well. So it's on their doorstep. This is the place where they are the ones who exerted authority and power and control, which is a lot about what they were, they were about. And here is Jesus upsetting their norm. But if we actually skip back now and we look at what happened in that conversation between um, the, uh, the invalid and Jesus, this is a question of, do you want to get well? And this is the question that I want to ask you guys this morning. Do you want to get well? Is there something that is in your life, something physical, spiritual, mental, something in there that's been on your mind for a while. Maybe not 38 years, but it might have been there for quite a while. And Jesus asked this question, do you want to get well? Is it something you've just put up with, got used to, deal with through, through the circumstances you're in, are you waiting for that special occasion when the waters stir? And when that happens, that's the time to go for prayer. That's the time that Jesus will move. I've kind of said it in that kind of, I put Jesus in that box there to do it at that particular time. Do you want to get well? Is it actually, you're kind of comfortable with where you are at the moment. It's not great, but I can deal with it. I know what's coming next. We can get lazy, we can get complacent, we can get used to where we're actually at. This is a challenging question, and it's challenged me, I must say as well, in this. Um, Sarah will know that, uh, that's my wife, 
Sarah will know that um, I will put up with, with niggles and ailments until I've got three or four, and then at that point, I might go to the doctor. You know, I'll just put up with them, it'll be all right. I'm sure whatever it is will, you know, if a bad finger, I'm sure it'll drop off or get better, it'll be fine. But, um, yeah, the delay, kind of comfortable, don't want to go through the process. And where do we look for help as we do this? Do we look to ourselves? Actually, in my strength, I can deal with this. I, I'll give a little testimony that I hadn't actually planned to, 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 to do this morning. The company I work for at the moment is, is very high-paced, and it demands a lot of hours. And in the first year that I worked there, I worked too many hours, and I burnt myself out. Couldn't see it coming, crashed and burned a little bit. So I had to kind of deal with, with that particular uh, event. I was relying on my own strength to get through that. I was relying on what I could do, on the number of hours I could work. It really wasn't helpful for me, it wasn't healthy for me, it wasn't healthy for my family either. We can do that, we can rely on our own strength. It's probably the reflex that a lot of us actually have. We might look around, we might rely on those people around us, we might have one or two people who, who we know is supporting us in all that we're, we're doing and potentially going through. Those people are amazing people, I am sure. But are we pinning everything on them rather than maybe looking to Jesus? Because that's where we should be looking. We should be looking at what Jesus actually wants for us and has for us. I'm going to invite the, the band to come back up and plug themselves in and start playing some, some nice music. But there's a challenge here. You know, are you sat in the waiting room waiting for your name to be called? waiting for that opportunity to actually occur? Or are you banging on the, if I use the doctor analogy, banging on the reception window going, where's my appointment? I want to see the doctor right now. I want to see Jesus right now. You might have been waiting for a very, very long time. You might actually be tired of asking. This might be a, a, an ask you've made to Jesus many, many times. And each time you ask, you maybe haven't had the answer that you were hoping for. There might be hurt there. There might be issues there. You might be living with, with illness and comfortable with where you're actually at at the moment. You just might be waiting for that pool to be stirred. Josh, um, this morning, talked about New Day as being a significant event in young people's lives. It's almost like, and I'm not saying it is, but it's a bit like that's the stirring of the pool. Actually, let's wait till New Day, then I'll get right with God. So young people, will, not just you, Will. Uh, young people, you're going to have an amazing time at New Day um, this coming week. But it can actually start now. So you can actually submit to uh, Jesus this morning and say, yeah, I'm available to you. I've got these issues. I want to sort that out. And go in to New Day, all guns blazing, rather than maybe waiting for day one, day two, day three. And a magical seminar, something amazing that someone says, a moment of inspiration. Let's get right with Jesus now. Let's do those things now and, uh, and react. So the challenge to you guys this morning, as we go back into worship, is to pick up your mat. You're like a circle that floats around me, keeping me safe and sound. And when I fall, you've tied a rope to me. You're blessing me every day.